You know, when I saw that there was a conference being held in California recently called Cessationist Conference, I found the whole thing so funny and ironic that I immediately went to the Babylon Bee to see if they'd written any articles about it. The Babylon Bee is a satirical news site, in case you didn't know. And they were a little late to the game on this one, unfortunately. But I did find a couple of other little dandies here. One article had the headline, Local cessationist specifically prays for non-miraculous healing. Another one says, John MacArthur sneaks into charismatic congregation inside hollowed out Trojan pulpit. Guys, it's okay to laugh at this stuff. I know that some of you Christians are so uptight that you think that laughing is a sin or something. But I've got news for you. God has a sense of humor. And sometimes he laughs at human stupidity. That's in the Bible, by the way. And if there's anything laughable, it's the idea that in a time when the spirit is being poured out around the world on a level never seen before in human history, that there's a bunch of people that like those emojis where the monkeys have their hands over their eyes and over their ears, and they're just willfully blind to all of the evidence, just saying, la da 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 cessationism, 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 cessationism. And so, yes, I'm going to laugh at this. And I'm going to call it out for the ridiculousness that it is. At the beginning of the 20th century, a small group of people began to experience an outpouring of the Spirit at a little place in California called Azusa Street. And today, less than 120 years later, there's anywhere from 600 to 700 million people around the world that identify as Pentecostal or charismatic, making this the largest movement, the largest group of Protestants in Christendom. That means that according to some statistics, like from Pew Research, about two-thirds of the world's evangelicals are Pentecostal charismatic. And since outside of Protestantism, much of what is considered Christianity is merely cultural, it's very likely that Pentecostals and charismatics comprise the majority of born-again Christians in the world. So this is not some little cult. This is not some little sect somewhere. Projections place the number of charismatics and Pentecostals by 2050 at upwards of a billion people. This is the future of Christianity, folks. Charismatic Christians alone now have as many followers as the entire Hindu religion and already more than Buddhism. Philip Jenkins, who is a very well-known secular historian who wrote the book, The Next Christendom, said it this way. He said, quote, since there were only a handful of Charismatics and Pentecostals in 1900 and several hundred million today, is it not reasonable to identify this as perhaps the most successful social movement in the past century? End quote. The Catholic theologian Ralph Martin said it this way, quote, my research has led me to make a bold statement in all of human history. No other non-political, non-militaristic, voluntary human movement has grown as rapidly as the Pentecostal charismatic movement. And, and listen, all of this has actually led to the greatest Harvest of souls, the greatest movement of evangelism in history. People are being saved by the hundreds of millions. The church is exploding around the world wherever it embraces the gifts and power of the Spirit. And guys, this is not just some abstract academic subject for me. I've seen this with my own eyes. God is moving around the world in signs and wonders and miracles galore. Meanwhile, a handful of critics sit in their posh California church, just a few miles away from where Azusa Street took place, by the way, and discuss for a whole week why the gifts of the Spirit don't happen anymore. Imagine a news anchor sitting outside in the middle of a hurricane reporting to his audience that it's not raining. This is modern cessationism. It is the definition of silly and laughable. But hey, we don't determine our doctrine on the basis of experience, right? Right. So even if everyone in the world were experiencing the gifts of the Spirit, if the Bible clearly said that they passed away, then we could say, case closed. And yet, as we saw in the previous episode, the cessationists don't have a single scripture supporting their view. So they don't have scripture. They don't have experience. What do they have? Well, they think they've got some pretty clever arguments. So that's what we're going to take a look at today on Daniel Kalenda Off the Record. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Off the Record. I'm Daniel Kalenda, and this is the second part of my series about the heresy of cessationism. 
And just to remind you, cessationism is the idea that certain gifts of the Spirit, specifically prophecy and tongues and healing and miracles, were only given for the apostolic age. And the idea is that now that we have the completed canon of Scripture, those gifts that existed primarily to authenticate the apostles and their message are no longer necessary and have passed away. That's the cessationist position. And in the last episode, we talked about the specific scriptures in the Bible that teach cessationism. And just by way of review, I think it would be helpful to give that list of passages once more. And here it is. Here is all of the scriptures in the Bible that teach cessationism. Now, just in case you're listening to this instead of watching, I'm holding up a blank piece of paper. The truth is this. There is not a single cessationist verse in the entire Bible. All of the scriptures that mention the gifts of the Spirit do so assuming that those gifts are in operation, that they are relevant, and they are important. So again, the Bible is a big problem for cessationists. So how do they make their case? Well, they have two primary sources for their doctrine. One is history. We'll talk about that later. And some very cleverly constructed arguments. Honestly, I have to give them full marks for creativity here. If I read the Bible and I realized that there wasn't a single verse in support of one of my doctrines, I just throw in the towel and say, well, I guess I was wrong. But these cessationists, man, they're tough. They don't give up so easily. They're really hanging in there. They found a bunch of ways to get the Bible to say what they want it to say, even though it actually says the exact opposite. Way to go, cessationists. Quite a precedent you're setting, eh? If the Bible doesn't support your theology, you can always just twist it and eisegete it until you get it to say what you want it to say. Now, some of these cessationists think that they've actually got the Bible in a pretty good headlock here. But what we're going to do today is go through some of those arguments and see if they hold any water. And by the way, I'm not going to straw man these arguments. I'm not going to give you the weakest and most ridiculous sounding version just to knock it down. I'm going to let them tell you what they believe in their own words. I'm going to quote them directly and then engage with their arguments from there. But before I do, I just want to start by addressing some of the questions and comments that came in after the last episode, because there's some things that I actually meant to talk about in the last broadcast, but I forgot. And one of them has to do with my tone. Several of you felt that I was a bit too harsh and abrasive in that last episode. For example, Barbara said that she could have done without the smart and sarcastic comments. I get that. And I actually debated with myself about how to handle this. If you know me, you know that I'm actually not a contentious person. I don't engage in every debate. I don't jump into the fray at every turn. And usually if I do address issues, I try to be careful and to treat everyone with respect and not to be too argumentative. But I decided to let loose this time for several reasons. First of all, the show is called Off the Record. That's literally the name of this podcast. And as I told you in my very first episode, I started this podcast because I wanted a place where I could just speak freely and informally. You can hear me preach on lots of subjects in lots of different places. It's very polished. I keep it very respectful. But this platform is specifically for me to address stuff that is a bit more difficult in a way that is unfiltered and raw. That's the show. That's what it's for. So why get upset when you get what you came for? And that leads me to the second reason. At the end of the day, this is who I am. Now, I realize some of you listening thought that I was being quite rude in the last episode. But anybody that knows me would understand that this is just my sense of humor in real life. I am a bit sarcastic and my humor is a bit dry. That's real. And if that offends you, I'm sorry. And guess what? This issue actually is something that is a big deal to me. You know what? We all have things that are more and less important to us. And the cessationism issue is one of those things that makes my blood boil. Not only is it completely and utterly unbiblical, even anti-biblical, but I believe that it seeks to rob millions of people of the experience of the gifts and power of the Spirit. And it at the same time is promoting a cold, powerless version of the gospel that is, in my opinion, a perversion. And I'm just not going to play nice about this. Some things ought to be handled with a bit of contempt. Cessationism is a view so unbiblical that I hate to even lend credibility to it by talking about it. But if I am going to address it, then I'm going to treat it with the antipathy and disrespect that it deserves. Again, it does not deserve to be treated as a reasonable position. And by the way, I find it somewhat ironic when some of you criticizing my tone come from these very hostile reform circles. 
where you guys are always blasting me online. And by the way, you'd never condemn your own founders for things that they said that were far more inflammatory. Like how about Luther calling Catholics pestilent Roman donkeys? How about calling the Pope a damned liar and the devil's mouthpiece? One time he responded to a critic saying, you're a brothel keeper and your God is the devil. Dude straight called him a devil worshiping pimp. I could go on and on with Luther. He's a gift that keeps giving. But of course, there's others like Knox and Huss and others that were also pretty abrasive. Maybe they were wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But, you know, maybe there's also a time for everything. And maybe it's time to call cessationism out for what it is, heresy. You know, honestly, charismatics are generally some of the nicest, most loving, most patient people I've ever met. And usually when we hear these very hostile things that the critics are saying, sometimes downright slanderous things, the reaction I usually see from charismatics is them just saying, it's okay, we're just going to love them. We're not going to repay evil for evil. And certainly that's the right approach. It's the, pro the approach that I personally also have tried to adopt as well. But look, here's what I'm seeing happening now. There is a whole group of people standing on the sidelines, listening to these critics and becoming convinced or at least confused by their confidently defiant rhetoric. You know, there's some people that will think that whoever's shouting the loudest has the best argument. And they take the silence coming from charismatics as a kind of tacit admission that we don't have a good response to the cessationists. And I think it's just time for somebody to stand up and say very clearly, wait a minute, you cessationists don't have a leg to stand on. You're twisting scripture. You're misleading people and you're doing it defiantly. And I'm not going to stand by quietly anymore. Here's another concern that I want to address. David commented, quote, I think you'd need to define your definition of the word heretical. To me, heretical means something that opposes orthodox doctrine, even more explain something against tier one doctrine. That being said, cessationism is not heretical. Very, very wrong. Yes, but not heretical. Now, I appreciate that, David. That's a very measured and reasonable comment. But there's a couple things I'd like to say about that. Typically, I would agree that the designation of heresy should be reserved for something that touches core Christian doctrine. But I actually do believe that cessationism does that. This is part of the case that I'm going to be making over the course of this series. But moreover, historically, heresy is something that threatens the survival of the faith. And I do believe that cessationism does that. And I'm going to argue for that as well in this podcast. But here's the bottom line. These very cessationists, like the ones that put on that cessationist conference, have actually set a new precedent of calling basically anyone they disagree with doctrinally a heretic. And if that's how they're going to play the game, then there's no way that I'm going to wear kid gloves when handling something like this that actually does, in my estimation, rise to the level of heresy. Now, again, look, we're taking a journey here. And by the end, you might agree that modern cessationism is heresy. You might still have the same softer stance towards cessationism that you have now. Or, look, I might change my mind. Let's just see what happens here. One final thing that I want to address is this. One person commented, quote, congratulations, you just called the reformers, the Puritans, and most of the church fathers heretics. Now, what this person is saying here, in case you didn't catch it, is that the reformers, the Puritans, and most of the church fathers were cessationists, he's saying. So by saying that cessationism is heretical, I've actually called all of these folks heretics. Now, again, that's a totally reasonable and common assumption. But I'm going to show you in an upcoming episode that it's actually wrong. Modern cessationists, like the ones leading that cessationist conference, are fundamentally different in their breed of cessationism. In fact, what modern cessationists believe and teach is something that has evolved over time into such a twisted, extreme version of what anyone before them believed that it shouldn't even be called by the same name. It's true that some of the church fathers made certain statements that seemed somewhat cessationist in nature. Yes. But most of those same church fathers said other things at other times that were clearly continuationist. And even when they did say things that sounded cessationist, they didn't mean them the same way modern cessationists do. They were mostly just making observations about the lack of gifts and miracles in their time. They were in no way making an argument for cessationism the way that modern cessationists do. In fact, if you go back and you look at their quotes in context, you'll see that if they made a comment about the gifts not manifesting anymore or something like that, they were usually lamenting that fact and using it as an indictment 
of the backslidden condition that the church was in. And look, even to say that some of those church fathers were cessationist or continuationist is it in itself anachronistic. In other words, it's imposing a modern way of thinking onto ancient people that have, would have had no grid for that debate. And if they had been armed with the kind of information that we have now, they would certainly disagree with modern cessationists. And again, I intend to prove that in an upcoming episode. Modern cessationism was born during the time of the Reformation. It was fertilized by the Enlightenment era rationalism, and it kept evolving all the way up until the 20th century when it came of age. And it's only actually taken on its modern form in the post Azusa Street world, where essentially it's the Pentecostal charismatic movement that's being rejected and opposed, which is a very, very modern idea indeed. Certainly nothing like any of the church fathers would have believed, and even quite different from anything taught by the reformers or Puritans, whose cessationism, you got to understand, was aimed primarily at Catholic miracle claims, like statues of the Virgin Mary crying and stuff. So again, modern cessationism is very different from, and even contrary to, anything that the church fathers believed and taught. And it's even more radical than what would have been believed by the reformers and the Puritans. And I'll show you that clearly. It won't be in this episode, probably in part four or five. Okay, enough introductory remarks here. Let's go ahead and get straight to an argument that seems to always enter into the conversation in one form or another whenever we talk about cessationism. And I'm going to use the version of this argument articulated by Samuel Waldron called the Cascade Argument. And here's Waldron explaining this in his own words. My argument against the continuation of the miraculous gifts is called the Cascade Argument. It goes like this. There are no apostles of Christ on earth today. Because there are no apostles of Christ, we may cogently argue that there are no prophets on earth today. Because there are no prophets, there are no tongue speakers. And because there are no tongue speakers, prophets or apostles of Christ, there are no miracle workers. Okay, now I'm not sure if Waldron actually coined the term cascade argument, but he certainly isn't the only one to make this case. This is actually a very common cessationist argument. They basically say that if the gift of apostles has ceased, even though the Bible doesn't say that it would, that constitutes a premise for assuming that other gifts have ceased without biblical evidence as well. Look at this quote by Tom Pennington, who, by the way, I believe he was one of the speakers in that cessationist conference. Tom Pennington says, quote, It's also significant, I think, that the gift of apostleship ceased without a crystal clear New Testament statement that it would. That means it is neither impossible nor unlikely that other significant changes happened with the passing of the apostles as well. You see, once you agree that there are no more apostles today at the same level as Peter and Paul, then you have admitted that there was a major change in the gifting of the Spirit between the apostolic and post-apostolic age. In fact, the one New Testament gift most frequently connected to miracles, the gift of apostleship, ceased, end quote. Now, I want all of us, especially any cessationists listening, to just pause for a moment and really think about how dangerous the precedent being set here is. It's like, well, the Bible doesn't say that there are no more miracles, but I haven't seen any miracles lately. So maybe we can just make that assumption without any biblical warrant. After all, the apostolic gift ceased, and the Bible didn't warn us about that one either. Wait a minute. Maybe there are are no more prophets either. Maybe there's no more prophecy or tongue speakers. Well, why stop there? Why not use the same method to bring the entire Bible into question? Maybe there's no more salvation. Maybe there's no more fruit of the Spirit. Maybe none of the Bible is relevant. Maybe God is dead. Guys, this is a stupid, dangerous, and unbiblical precedent. Be that as it may, even this silly argument hinges on the premise that there are no apostles of Christ on the earth today. Now, I recorded an entire podcast, a pretty long one. If I remember right, it was like nearly two hours long, all about the apostolic gift and whether or not the gift continues or is ceased. I'll put a link to that podcast in the description if you want to look in more depth at that subject. And listen, there's a lot more nuance to this subject than I can address here. So please don't start leaving ignorant comments about how I don't understand what apostles of Christ are or something like that. Don't do that before you go and listen to the more in-depth podcast. I do understand the nuance of Waldron's argument. I've read his entire book. I don't have time to address all of it right now. But for our purposes today, let me just clarify a couple of things. What is certainly obvious 
is that the original 12 apostles are no longer with us. And nobody today has the authority that the original 12 had. No one today can write scripture. There's no argument about that. The 12 apostles of the Lamb were unique. There will never be anyone like them again. And we could spend time proving that, but I don't think it's worth the effort since I don't think anybody disagrees. But what Waldron and cessationists like him do is to actually conflate that special group of 12 apostles with the broader category of apostolic ministry, and then to basically say and infer that all genuine apostolic ministry has ceased. And that is, as I proved in that other podcast, a category mistake. When we, continuationists, to say that we believe there are still apostles today, we're not talking about the 12 apostles. We obviously are talking about a ministry gift. It was described by Paul right alongside evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's what it says in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Look at that. The same Christ that gave apostles and prophets for the purpose of building up his body until we all reach unity and maturity, etc., also gave evangelists, pastors, and teachers at the same time for the same reason. So how can you say that two of the gifts in that list are obsolete and the other three are still relevant? What legitimate rule of biblical interpretation gives you the right to do that? Do tell. I'm sure the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses would love to use that trick. Now, I showed in my podcast, the one on apostles, that there is no warrant exegetically or otherwise for separating this list of gifts into different categories. They continue or cease as a group. If apostles and prophets are no longer for today, then neither are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But if you believe that God still calls pastors and teachers, you also have to accept that he also still calls apostles and prophets. If you say, well, apostles and prophets are given for the sole purpose of authoring scripture, I say nonsense. Ephesians 4 does not say that God gave apostles and prophets for the writing of scripture. It says in verse 12 that they were given to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That function is still necessary and therefore the gift is still relevant. If you say, well, when Paul says that, quote, he gave apostles and prophets in Ephesians 4.11, that means they're gone because he gave is in the past tense. Again, I would say nonsense. As I talked about before, that New Testament scholar, D.A. Carson pointed out, citing Frank Stagg, who wrote about the abused aorist, that the tense of the Greek aorist verb, like the one being used here in Ephesians 4.11, does not necessarily indicate something once for all or, com or completed in the past, as many interpreters often claim. Given the context, it allows for the ongoing, continuous giving of the gifts to the church. And again, even without knowing Greek, the scriptures plainly tell us how long we have these gifts and exactly when they'll become unnecessary. Again, Ephesians 4.14 says that we have these gifts until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Not they were given until the canon of Scripture is complete. Now again, I go into great depth on this in my podcast about apostles, but let me just summarize and reiterate the problem that cessationists have regarding Ephesians 4. Number one, the apostles mentioned here are not identified with the 12 apostles. The apostles here are not in a closed group like the 12. There's something that is ongoing, just like evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Number two, Ephesians 4 does not say that apostles were given for the purpose of authoring scripture. It says that they, as well as the other gifts, were given for the edification of the body, which is an ongoing need. Number three, it is impossible to interpret Ephesians 4.11 as referring to something that was completed in the past. The only possible interpretation, grammatically and logically, is that all of these gifts are ongoing and continuous. And also, the grammatical structure of this verse in the Greek makes it impossible to separate apostles and prophets from evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You can't say something about one or two of the five without saying it about all of them. As Dr. John Ruffin said, quote, the implication of the Ephesian metaphor for cessationism hangs on the use of he gave, he token aorist in verse 11. Was this a singular punctiliar act as some would say the aorist tense implies? If so, 
This would argue for the uniqueness and cessation of the apostles and prophets, but it would also require the cessation of the other categories of ministry, evangelists and pastor teachers, since they are all placed in parallel construction and are characterized by the accusative plural endings. If the giving of these gifted people to the church is an ongoing process, then similarly, there is no exegetical warrant for artificially dividing these ministries into categories of extraordinary and ordinary, suggesting that one group is no longer given by the victorious Lord, but the other continues. Exegetically, the gifts continue or cease as a single group, end quote. So again, the big problem cessationists have in this verse is that Paul does not just talk about apostles and prophets. He also talks here about evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Cessationists can't say that all of these gifts were only given in the past because that would mean that there are no pastors and teachers and all of the guys preaching and teaching this nonsense would have to go resign from their ministries. So here's the dilemma that they face. How can cessationists reinterpret Ephesians 4.11 in such a way that it makes apostles and prophets on the one hand obsolete, but allows us to keep evangelists, pastors, and teachers on the other hand? Well, here's the brilliant solution they found. There's actually two. The first one is to say that the apostolic and prophetic gift actually is still around. However, today the ministry of apostles and prophets continues exclusively through their writings. So for example, Waldron says it like this, quote, the ministry of both the apostle and the prophets did not cease with their death. The church continues to be ministered unto by the writing of the apostles and prophets, end quote. And so Waldron is claiming here that the ministry of the original apostles and prophets does continue today, but only through the Bible. And so that would mean that we actually don't need God to call individuals today to fill those roles. Now, on its face, to a lot of people, this seems to be a quite reasonable argument. And I would agree that certainly the scriptures that were left to us by the apostles and prophets do quite capably attend to the building up and equipping of the body of Christ. But on the other hand, as I pointed out in the last episode, this is a self-defeating argument. Why? Well, it's the very writings of the apostles, like the apostle Paul, for example, that tell us that the gifts continue. For example, Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.7 that they are not lacking in any gift as they await the revealing, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a hint in Paul's epistles that he had any sense that these gifts were going to cease before Christ returns. And that's why everything that he tells the Corinthians has to do with the ongoing nature of the gifts. They can all prophesy. He tells them not to despise prophecy. He tells them not to forbid tongues. He tells them not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And again, Look, he tells them that they can all prophesy, not merely that they can all read what previous prophets have prophesied. So I don't think the explanation that the apostolic and prophetic gifts continue only through their writings holds any water. But there is one more interesting cessation of solution to the problem of Ephesians 4.11, which appeals to another passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, which says that the church is quote, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And so cessationists say that what you can do is you can use Ephesians 2.20 to interpret Ephesians 4.11. And that will allow you to say that the apostles and prophets are no longer given, but evangelists, pastors, and teachers remain. Here's how the cessationist uh, theologian Nancy Almodovar said it. Now remember, what she's trying to do here is give an explanation for why it's legitimate for cessationists to take Ephesians 4.11, which lists apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers together, and to say that apostles and prophets are no longer given, but the rest evangelists, pastors, and teachers are. So again, referring to Ephesians 4.11 now, she says, quote, because there is no distinction in this passage as to which office is continual and which is not, it must be read in view of Ephesians 2.20, where Paul delineates that the apostles and prophets are the foundation no builder ever places a foundation a second time in a building. Foundations are once for all tasks. Pastors and teachers continue because they are not foundational offices, but instead are leaders and rulers over the congregations after the apostles were gone. But the foundation does not need to be relayed, end quote. Okay, so how do we respond to this? Well, all you've got to do is employ some basic common sense. This is not difficult to grasp at all, unless you've got a commitment to cessationist presuppositions. Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4 are talking about two different things. In Ephesians 2, it's quite clear that Paul is talking about the apostles and the prophets 
who, along with Christ Jesus himself, constitute the foundation of our faith. But then when you get to Ephesians 4, Paul is talking about ministry gifts that have been given to the church in every generation. And he lists them as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In Ephesians 2, when Paul is talking about the church being built on the foundation of, quote, the apostles and prophets, he's not just talking about any old apostles and prophets here. He's talking about the 12 apostles of Christ and the prophets of old. Now, again, there is a vast difference between apostles and the apostles. And there is a vast difference between prophets and the prophets. Luke tells us in Acts 21 about a prophet named Agabus. Agabus was a prophet, but he was not one of the prophets, right? Anna was a prophet, but that didn't make her one of the prophets. And the same could be said today about plenty of others that are prophets. They're prophets like Agabus and Anna, not like Jeremiah and Joel. Okay, so Paul can easily talk about the apostles and prophets as the foundation upon whom the whole building of the church has been established in Ephesians 2. And that can be in the past tense. It can be a once for all reality while still allowing the apostolic and prophetic gifts mentioned in Ephesians 4.11 to continue. These passages are not talking about the same thing. While we're on the subject, let me just address another passage that somebody asked me about in the comment section of the last episode. And I'm mentioning this now, not only because it was a scripture that I forgot to mention last time, but also I think it's very relevant at this point. So Elijah said, quote, Daniel, I would love it if you would provide your explanation of Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. I grew up charismatic and still attend a church that identifies as such. But recently I found myself questioning a lot about what I've been taught, end quote. Okay, so what is this brother talking about? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says that God, with sundry times and in diverse manners, hath in times past spoken to the fathers by the prophet, but he hath in these last days spoken unto us by a son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world. Okay, so somebody reading this passage through a cessationist lens will say, see, the scripture says right there that God used to speak to people through prophecy in the past, but now he speaks to people only through the completed canon of scripture. But that's not what it says, is it? It doesn't say that God in times past spoke to fathers by prophets. It says that in the past, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets. Now, there is a huge difference between fathers and the fathers, isn't there? All males who have children are fathers. But there is a vast difference between fathers and the fathers. The fathers are biblical figures from the Old Testament and maybe also referring to the ancient ancestors of the children of Israel. And listen, there is as big a difference between fathers and the fathers as there is between prophets and the prophets. The prophets are the people that spoke in the Bible. Prophets are just people called to and known for speaking prophetically. The prophets are figures from the Old Testament. These are people who were chosen by God to deliver his word to the people of Israel, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and many others that you know. But cessationists want to use a verse like this to contrast modern prophecy with God's word. In other words, they're saying something like, in the past God spoke in prophecy, but now he speaks to us in the Bible. But this juxtaposition is just silly on several levels. First of all, this verse is actually in the Bible. <laughs> so what that means is the canon is obviously not yet closed when Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 is being written. So this verse cannot possibly be talking about the closed canon. But even more importantly, much of what the writer to the Hebrews means when he says the prophets is actually scripture. It would include things like the major and minor prophets. In other words, he can't be saying something like in the past, God spoke through the prophets, but now he speaks through the scripture because when Hebrews references the prophets here, it's another way of saying scripture, the law and the prophets. What is that? It's the Old Testament. But most of all, this contrast is silly because this passage simply doesn't say that God spoke with prophecy in the past, and now he's speaking to us through the Bible. The writer to the Hebrews is making a totally different point, and it's in keeping with the flow of the first two chapters of Hebrews, that Christ is superior to everything. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. He is our superior high priest. He introduces a superior covenant. And so in that same vein, Christ is superior to the prophets and to all the messengers that God sent in the days of old. And he doesn't just come as someone delivering a message, he himself is the message. Jesus Christ is God's ultimate revelation. Now, 
Nowhere does it say that God is not speaking prophetically anymore. And in no way does this passage preclude the possibility that people will still prophesy today. But as they do, God will be speaking to us by and through his son. Like it says in Revelation 19.10, that it's the testimony of Jesus Christ that is the spirit of prophecy, which means that the central theme and the essence of prophecy is Christ. And by the way, that's true for Old and New Testaments. All the prophetic messages, all the revelations in the Bible find their ultimate fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. All right, so again, nothing in Scripture indicates that any of the gifts have ceased, and that includes the apostolic and prophetic gifts. But there is one extra-biblical argument that cessationists make that has to do with this idea that if there are still apostles and prophets, and if there are still people who can speak in tongues and prophesy and perform miracles and healings, then here's the question. How can we be sure that these people won't add to the closed canon of Scripture? And again, this is what many cessationists express as their primary concern. They're cessationists because they say they're trying to protect the Bible. They're trying to keep these crazy charismatics from adding to the Bible with their tongue talking and prophecy. Now, I said it last time. I'll say this again because I think it bears repeating. But of course, we all agree that the Bible is a closed historical document. And it's true that the New Testament books were either written or endorsed by a special group of apostles. These are the men that were with Christ and they were the witnesses to his resurrection. And so since that first generation of apostles is gone, they can't write or endorse any new scripture and therefore no new scripture can be added. We are all in agreement on that point. But here's where the cessationist goes off the rails. They conclude then that since the canon is closed, that means that there can no longer be any apostles or prophets. And as we've already seen, that is the error that sets off their cascade of stupidity. So you can see how important and central this issue of the closed canon is to the cessationist worldview. Sam Waldron writes, quote, the entire Christian church acknowledges that no new book has been added to the canon of the New Testament for almost 20 centuries. There's no debate about this. The New Testament gains its authority from the endorsement of the apostles and the principle of apostolic authority. This is so, first, because the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20, Matthew 16.17, and second, because only an apostle of Christ can claim to speak the word of Christ. It is the apostle of Christ that is as the man himself. Thus, apostles had either to write or endorse each book of the New Testament. The fact of the closed character of the canon, therefore, assumes and implies the closed character of the apostolate, end quote. So just look for a second at what Waldron is saying here. Let me read that last line again. The fact of the closed character of the canon, therefore, assumes and implies the closed character of the apostolate. What do you think about that statement? Is it rational to say that we know the canon is closed because the original 12 apostles are gone? Yes, I think that's a perfectly legitimate way of looking at this. So then is the inverse also true? Are there no more apostles today because the canon is closed? No, that makes no sense. That, that's circular. To say the canon is closed because the apostles are gone and the apostles are gone because the canon is closed, that makes no sense. If that's the way your logic works, then what you're saying is that if someone could show somehow that there actually is an apostle around today, maybe through apostolic succession or whatever, then they could make an argument that the canon is still opened or should be reopened. Look, the canon is closed because the original 12 apostles are dead. In fact, look, you could actually drop the word apostles and make the exact same argument. You could say the canon is closed because the original 12 disciples are gone. Now, is the fact that the 12 disciples are gone evidence that the canon is closed? Yes. Okay, well, then since the canon is closed, wouldn't that also mean that there could be no more disciples? No, not at all. We're not talking about disciples being gone. There will always be disciples. We're talking specifically about a certain group of disciples, the 12 who were with Jesus from the beginning, who ate and drank with him after the resurrection. Why is that important? Because they were the ones that were called to be witnesses unto him. Their testimony about Christ is the closest that we can get to Jesus Christ himself. And that's why all of the church regarded their extant writings and the ones that they endorsed, like Paul's, as canonical. According to Ephesians 4.11, the apostolic gift continues to be necessary for the ongoing foundational health of the church. But that does not mean that somebody that has an apostolic calling today would have the authority to write scripture. They most certainly do not. As Waldron said, 
The entire Christian church acknowledges that no new book has been added to the canon of the New Testament for almost 20 centuries. There is no debate about this. I agree. There's no debate about this. Why do cessationists keep pretending that this is an issue when it's not? No charismatics want to add anything to the scriptures. Our exercise of the gifts of the spirit is not an attempt to usurp scripture, but to follow it. And you know what else? I actually think cessationists realize this. It seems to me the whole issue of modern apostles threatening the sufficiency of scripture is just a red herring. The role of apostles and prophets and the gift of the spirit generally is not to replace the scripture, but to affirm and apply the scripture through the power of the spirit to every generation. Just like cessationists need teachers and evangelists to keep teaching and evangelizing in every generation, in that same way, we also need the ongoing pioneering ministry and miraculous affirmation of the gospel in every generation. Now, on the other hand, even if the cessationists' concern here is genuine, even if they really are just trying to protect the Bible, the reality is that they've become so eager to protect the scripture that they've actually forgotten to obey it. The very text they're fighting for and trying to defend so eagerly specifically says things like earnestly desire the best gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. It says, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 39. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20, do not despise prophetic utterances. Okay, so the same New Testament that they're defending says far more about apostles and prophets than it does about evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Look, the Bible is not just a symbol to be defended. It has instructions to be obeyed. And if cessationists aren't going to obey the scripture, then why bother to preserve it? Since we started with abrasive Luther quotes, let's go ahead and give one more. Martin Luther said, you may as well quit reading and hearing the word of God and give it to the devil if you do not desire to live according to it. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. We're almost finished. But again, if you want to hear more about the ongoing relevance of the apostolic gift, feel free to listen to that podcast about apostles. And listen, I'll just tell you that Waldron's assertion that there are no more apostles today is just complete nonsense. Now, some of you might object that Waldron is careful not to say that there are no more apostles. He made it very clear that his argument is that there are no more apostles of Christ. But it's Waldron that is convoluting these categories. And at the end of the day, what he means to discredit is people today who identify with the gift of apostleship mentioned in Ephesians 4.11. And that's what I'm combating. Now, let's take a different approach. What if I don't even argue with Waldron on this point? How about we go ahead and give Waldron and cessationists the benefit of the doubt and concede for the sake of argument that the apostolic gift has ceased? So watch this. I'm just going to go ahead for the sake of argument and grant Waldron's premise that apostles have passed, that the gift has ceased. Guess what? That still doesn't prove his point. Remember, his claim was, quote, there are no apostles of Christ on the earth today. Because there are no apostles of Christ, we may cogently argue that there are no prophets on earth today. Because there are no prophets, there are no tongue speakers. And because there are no tongue speakers, prophets, or apostles of Christ, there are no miracle workers, end quote. Guys, this is frankly one of the most irrational deductions I've ever heard. Literally, none of these points follow. Look, even if you could prove conclusively that there are no more apostles, which you can't, in what sense would that imply that there are no more prophets? And if you could prove there are no prophets, which you can't, how would that imply there are no more tongue speakers? And if you could prove there are no more tongue speakers, which you can't, how would that imply that there are no miracle workers? None of these conclusions follow. Remember, if you want to prove cessationism, the burden of proof is on you to show from Scripture that the gifts have ceased. Every scripture passage in the Bible that addresses the gifts of the Spirit assumes their ongoing function and continu continuation. There's not one single exception to that rule. There's not a single verse in the Bible that teaches cessationism. I showed you that in the previous podcast in part one. So what you've got to do, cessationists, is make an argument from scripture for each of these points. What evidence do you have from scripture that there are no more apostles today? What evidence do you have from scripture that there are no more prophets? What evidence do you have from Scripture that there are no more tongue speakers or miracle workers? You have to argue for these points, and uh, good luck with that. And so again, even if you could show conclusively that there are no more apostles, if you then say that that implies that there are no more prophets, then how in the world could you say then that that same logic 
does not apply to all of the other gifts on the list, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In other words, if the passing away of apostles would imply the passing away of prophets, wouldn't it also imply the passing away of evangelists, pastors, and teachers by that same logic? They're all listed together. As Dr. Ruffin wrote, they're written in a grammatically parallel construction with the same accusative plural endings. They continue or cease as a group. What kind of sketchy ratchet hermeneutics is this? Cessationists? Okay, so Waldron's so-called cascade argument actually turns out to be nothing more than a cascade of terrible, inexcusable, completely irrational nonsense. And this is the linchpin of his entire cessationist perspective. In the next episode, I'm going to be talking about some of the specific gifts of the Spirit that cessationists have problems with. I'll talk about tongues and prophecy, miracles and healings. I'm going to answer the question that I always get asked by cessationists, which is, if you have the gift of healing, why don't you just go to the hospital and heal everybody? And I think cessationists think this is a really clever gotcha question. Well, I'll answer it. And the answer might surprise you. And then we're going to get into some really interesting stuff. I'm going to talk to you about where cessationism comes from, and I'm going to show you how damaging these ideas have been for the body of Christ. So once again, don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode of Daniel Kalenda Off the Record. Now, don't forget, if you have any questions that you'd like me to address on this program, or if you just want to get in touch with us, you can send those questions to questions at askdk.com. The DK stands for Daniel Kalenda, just in case you didn't make that connection. Again, that's questions at askdk.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. If you're watching on social media, be sure to like the page or subscribe to the channel. I've got so much amazing content on deck for you coming through the rest of the year. You don't want to miss a single episode of Daniel Kalenda Off the Record. Thank you.